Before we start, I want to give a quick shout out to my sponsor this quarter, Spec. Spec is a leader in the customer journey management space with their patented Trust Cloud platform that connects you to any fraud vendor through a no code implementation. This allows you to have full control and visibility into your customer journeys, orchestrate and operationalize any fraud, abuse, and payments API, and take action on your website without having to negotiate priority with your engineering teams. The Spec Trust Cloud keeps you up to date as your needs change over time. Please check them out by visiting www.specprotected.com to learn about how they can help your fraud fighting future. Now let's dive into the episode. Everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Fraud Boxer Podcast. Today, we're going to kind of continue a little bit of this series about the MRC and, and how it was before and how it was after and all that. And we're going to keep that going today. Um, also, have an, an interesting product that, that's popped up in our space that I'd like to talk about. So, I've invited a very special guest. Her name is Erica Liebman. So, how are you doing today? Doing great. How are you? <laughs> I'm pretty good. You know, it's it is Friday when we're recording this, so I'm excited to get my Friday on and 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 get to the weekend. You know, so uh, definitely looking forward to that. How how how's your Friday going? Uh, it's going. It's been a busy, busy week. I'm also looking forward to a weekend of relaxation. Maybe catch some music. We'll see what happens. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, you were you were texting me before we got on this about how crazy your day was already. So I'm excited for you to hopefully get some uh, some R and R in and go see some music. I am a huge live music person myself, um, so I'm ha- probably going to go try and find some of that tonight. But uh, you know, in LA. It's- <laughs> yeah, it, it, there, there's a lot going on, but I think my, my type of music is a little different than your type of music. My type of music can be hard to find in L.A. because I like um, when I go see live music, I like heavy metal, which is usually uh, uh, around. But I also like like drinking bro country. And that's a little harder okay. to find down here. <laughs> well, I feel like maybe we should switch because the music that I like to go see is really easy to find in L.A. I'm in Richmond, which is a very like grunge, underground, um, met- heavy metal kind of scene. Yeah. That was a big punk punk scene back in like the the 90s and stuff there and even the 80s. Yeah, like L- Lamb of God is based from here. They're all from this area, so totally more up your alley than mine. Yeah. Not to say I don't like a good mix, but um so so you and I met in an interesting fashion. So I have been kind of a little bit on a tear about um salespeople and how much salespeople were driving me bonkers um on the lead up to the MRC. Uh, some of the emails I was getting were just like out of control, like not even in the volume, but just in the content and how they were going, which um inspired me to to kind of record some episodes I and mean, we'll kind of go back a minute there you had actually messaged me in a very nice fashion like asking for some advice about the industry specifically because you're you're newer to this specific industry and uh you and I, I i pointed you in a direction of a podcast that apparently had no longer existed which then yeah. gave me the idea to come back and re-record it so thank you for that you were the inspiration for re-recording that uh, but how you approached it and how, how now our conversations happened was was really organic and it was really um, it was a, a nice change of pace for what the emails that I normally get and the messages that I normally get. So, yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you for that. I mean, I I've been in sales a very, very long time and coming into the fraud space, I had seen a lot of messaging about what not to do and actually came across your messaging when I was, I shouldn't say stalking, but kind of stalking a prospect that I was looking to connect with on LinkedIn. And he had been following a bunch of your posts and he might figure out who I'm talking about from listening to this at some point, because we have since connected. Uh, But it led me to you and I had started seeing a bunch of your posts. And there was one post in particular you had put out that it was like, here's all the don'ts of what to do yeah. with salespeople in this space. And there are a lot of offenders of some of the things that you put in that post. And so I was kind of coming into it from a different angle of, I've seen all the things of what not to do, but what is going to work? And how do we change the narrative? Because we do still need salespeople and we need pe- salespeople yep. along with merchants and unfortunately, some of those bad salespeople have given people like me a bad rap. So it's you got to be a lot more creative than you used to have to be. Um, but it yeah. sparked a really neat conversation, I think, between you and I that has 
built a much stronger relationship between us where we can actually make some change in the industry together and make it a more symbiotic relationship between merchants and vendors. Yeah. And I think that, that that's, that's absolutely correct. Like I think the, the, the relationship piece, like I said in the, in the last the episode that I did re-record is relationship piece matters. And like you and I have since been on a couple of, of pitch calls for my own company, you know, where we would look at the, at the product and, and there's still something that possibly on the table there, but had it been a normal cold email, it would have never have gotten that far. But it, in, in you and I have a dialogue enough now that like I can say no to you in a, in a way that you, you understand and you're not offended by it, if you know what I mean. Totally. And that's, that's a, that's a good spot to be in, in a relationship, but that doesn't mean tomorrow my needs might completely change or we might launch a new product. We might do a FinTech product or something. And I might immediately have a need for that very exact thing. And who's the first person I'm going to call? It's going to be you. So Hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> don't forget me, Jordan. Yeah. Well, I'll, you know, I'll get you excited a little bit here, you know, but, uh, <laughs> but how did you wind up, um, in our industry, because our industry, I always like to ask people that because it's not something that that people even know exists usually. Yeah. Uh, so and then they uncover and they peel back the layers of this onion and they, they realize there's a whole thing in there. So how, how'd you get here? It was a happy accident for me. Um, so I like I said, I've been in sales a long time. Um, most recently had been in software sales, but specifically in construction for a very, very long time. That was really my background. And um, grew up in that world. My father was an architect. So that was a very natural fit for me. And uh, decided to leave the last company that I was with. And I was talking with a friend who actually was already working for Barif, who I work for now as the recruiter. They've been reaching out to me and saying, you got to check us out. You got to check us out. I'm going, oh, cybersecurity. I'm yeah. really of interest to me much. Um, but he was persistent. And so we went to lunch one day and he was telling me a little bit more about it. And I started to realize just how big the impacts of this space are. And even though I was saying that I wasn't interested in it, the things that happen in cybersecurity, the things that happen in fraud, whether or not I take an interest, they're going to have an impact on me and my life. And so yeah. not that I could be part of a change for better in the digital world that we're living in, that really inspired me to kind of delve deeper and take a look and get more involved. And here I am. Yeah. And uh, on those construction ones, did you ever have to go like on sites and wear hard hats and all that? Totally. And it was so much fun. Really? I loved, I you loved, really had to do that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I was doing some of the um, most before I was in the software side of things, I was doing more of the commercial furniture side. So actually doing some of the design work, walking through some of the spaces that were in construction and needing to put the finishing touches on those. I loved being in that space. It was really fun. And creative um and that industry is a whole beast of its own and yeah. sometimes i miss it and other days i'm like oh i never want to go back but are the, um are the people that like that are buying the people that were buying the products there like how how are the, how do they differ from the people that are in the cyber security is oh i mean i'm sure like the people that have to make the decisions are usually probably pretty high up there so they're probably more they're not so much the guys putting the bolts in the building but they're more you know, IT type of people, which IT type of person is kind of the same across <laughs> everywhere, right? I think so. But being, when I when I made the transition into construction software, it was a big learning curve. Um, still is a big learning curve. It's an industry that's very averse to technology as a whole. You know, these are guys that their passion is to use their hands and see something in real life actually take shape. And so getting into anything that's like, technology where it's, you can't look, touch and feel it as much is very uncomfortable for them. And so I was selling to the C-suites in a lot of these companies, but some of the guys in the C-suite are people who were the guys swinging the hammer just a week ago on a job site. So um, a lot of education, um, a lot of resistance to change. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they're going, well, I've done this way for 30 years. Why should I change anything now? Um, but there's definitely a change of the guard happening in that industry too, where they are becoming a lot more advanced in technology than they were, let's say even five years ago. Um, but it, it was a big learning curve that I would say is similar to our industry as well. Um, what I'm finding in this space is the technology evolves so quickly and fraud is changing so rapidly that Every even the people who have been in the industry for 20 years, they're still learning as well. And there's new regulations and 
laws coming out all the time that are also changing and reshifting how we all work together. So I love that education piece of it. That I would say is very similar from one journey to the next. That's funny because I, I do have a, a a whole series coming out about like education and how education is is going to be a bigger focus, especially this year. And we always talk in 2023 about individual threats that are going to be happening and, and affecting our space. But the education piece, like how it all still kind of goes along with that is is going to be fundamental because it is it is changing fast it's changing faster faster than it ever has with like the fraudsters have machine learning products too they have ai they have software as a service like we just i just put on an episode like a month ago about that uh that they they're it's they're people are paying other people to make companies to fraud people and and that's something that's going to continue to happen so you know it, i will say like I, i've noticed in our industry too this like resistance to change too like i remember when i was very first started in it i was in a in a breakout session actually at an mrc and um they were talking about it was device id was the new hotness at that time and there was a person that came into this meeting from one of the large airlines i've never seen this person ever again but they mm. were like we don't need that for 20 years i've been doing this and i don't need something like that and everybody was like, what? Like, just because for the last 20 years, like when you 20 years ago at that time, computers were barely even a thing. So like, what is this person thinking about? And now, like, I haven't, like I said, I hadn't seen this person ever, ever since then. But uh, thankfully, I know most of those airlines and that particular airline now has a device ID tool. <laughs> but it's just like that the resistance to change is hard, but you have to, you just have to have that open mind. And that's, that's how do we how do we get people to understand that? And I think like some of it is going to have to be the changing of the guard, like you said, of the people that are in the room are going to have to be the ones that 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 have the, the new generation coming in is going to be the ones that has to have the open mind, you know, that makes What's sense. What's interesting is I think consumers are driving it a lot now too. So um, one of the things that I noticed a lot at MRC was that a lot of the people that I'm talking to are people who talk about being resistant to change. You're so afraid of friction. Nobody wants friction at the front end yeah. of their experience. Everybody wants to make it easy for shoppers to engage online, but consumers are starting to change their attitude a little bit about privacy in a digital setting and understanding that privacy and autonomy come at a cost in the business that we're in and you're putting yourself at risk in doing so. So I, I do see that shifting the landscape and the narrative, but it, it's definitely something that's going to come with time. It's not going to happen overnight. That's that's a good point because like I've put, I've said a couple of times on some other panels back in couple of years ago is especially like with Apple is is with their marketing or, or a large driver of this privacy thing. And then you have states like California, which has CCPA and then obviously GDPR over in, in the EU where this, this, your, your information and what's being done with your information is more on the forefront of people's minds. And before they'd sign up for Facebook, they wouldn't even care. Like whatever, whatever, just get me on there so I can like a picture of my friend while they're in Mexico, you know, it doesn't matter. But now like people are be like, okay, where is my information going? I'm getting like 50,000 emails today. Where these even come from? And Apple has done things like this private relay, um, the hide my IP stuff, you know, people are using VPNs more than ever to, to get around these things. And, and there's more people don't want to use their real information to make purchases. And it comes back to like this friction thing too. It's like, okay, we all want a frictionless experience. We all like, that's the, the dream, but there is a balance that needs to happen with having a frictionless experience, but also having KYC on when people are buying things. Like what I always just said on my panels is if money's changing hands, I need to know where the money's coming from. And like the federal government likes that with money laundering, you know, like they, they have the same concerns, but when money's changing hands for a good, I need to know where, where it's coming from. And especially for larger goods or, or goods that have like a name attached to it. Like, like I think like concert tickets are one thing, you know, like it's, it's good to know who these tickets belong to, but if you're having things like bank accounts, credit cards, um, things that need to be tied to an identity, you, you can pop more friction on that because there needs to, there's a no that needs to be known. And I think that, that like, if you, if you balance a little bit of friction in there on, on, just even regular purchases so that it, there's an expectation that there could be something. If we can get that into a more like expected process, we'd have a lot easier thing instead of trying to hide everything in the back end, but have, there's an expectation this customer, okay, you might encounter something, but that's because, and if you put the messaging in, it's like, like with you guys, you know, like, Hey, we need a photo of your driver's license to validate against your face because we need to make sure that you're, that's really you. We're protecting you. You have to position your messaging as to why you're doing that on the side of the customer and protection and privacy, even, you know, like we're, we need to be, we're trying to help you out. So I don't know. I put a lot in there. <laughs> piece, right. 
So it's it's back to that education of educating both the consumer, educating the merchants that we're working with, educating the vendors that we're partnering with. It's tenfold, I think. And um, you know, I, I way back when, before I was in construction, I actually worked in retail for many, many years. That's where my sales career really can I cool. can I guess? Can I take a guess? Sure. Were you like were you sales? Were you on the floor sales? Like for, before I take my guess. I started, yes. Hollister or American Eagle? <laughs> so my very, very first, yes, was actually, well, no, not Hollister, but I did, I did a stint there when I was in high school. It was in- Ab- Ab- Abercrombie. It's the, uh, it's the same company, oh, right? Hollister. You were right. It was Hollister. Uh, but believe it or not, my very first was actually a company called Steinmart. I don't know if you're familiar. Yeah, with that. they still have one over here. Yeah. Uh, so for the <laughs> longest time, I thought it was like a meat, like a butcher store. And I never <laughs> went in there because the logo looks kind of like another, like a, like another yeah. grocery store over here. Wow. Yeah, but- it was an Interesting, um, interesting position to be in. I never dreamed that it would become a career for me. In college, I was with Juicy Couture at one point, um, left there and ended up starting really launching my sales career at Toomey, a high-end luggage company. Mm-hmm. And they were very, very good to me. It was a great experience working there. But I still think back to a lot of my experience there and in the world that we're in today and a lot of the merchants that we're talking to. And in a digital transaction, it's so interesting. It's like we're inviting everybody to come shop in our store, walk through our front doors. There's no camera. There's no lock on the door. There's not even an access point. And they're all coming in with masks on. And then we're wondering, huh, why is fraud still happening? It's just kind of crazy to think about it in the digital world versus the physical, how much more protection there was there and how we shopped and how consumers behaved in in that physical world. And how do we make that sort of repeatable more in the digital space, but without making them feel like we're treating everybody as if they were a criminal. That's so funny. I nailed the Hollister thing. That's just <laughs> all, all, all you Hollister folks always have that same that same look, you know. It's like it's, I can smell it right now when you're talking about it, unfortunately. <laughs> I like I don't think I ever like I went into one like one time and it's it was always super weird. Like I'm so I worked I I too worked retail in my younger years. And and it was back in the day when the convention was if you had a wide store opening, that's how you get more people in there. And then Hollister came and just completely changed that with those, like, try to look like a shack. How do you even get in the damn thing? And it worked. It worked for so long. It was really dark and it looked like a cool, mysterious place you wanted to go into. It was like a club, kind of exclusive, right? Exactly. Exactly. And I never bought a damn thing from there. I was more of a Zoomies kid myself, but I uh, probably paid a little bit too much money to be walking around with just Hollister branding all over me. That was that was a trend. You were advertising for them. Well, you were paying to <laughs> advertise for them, but you know it, it was a trend. Like if you weren't wearing like those little ripped up kind of baggy light jeans with your Hollister shirt on, you were not cool. You were not going to be sitting at that table. Totally. Yeah. I grew up in rural Philadelphia where it was like, where we, outside of the city where we were, it was like, you had to wear the cool Abercrombie clothes. I remember even Vera Bradley being a trend at one point. It was at the time it was just very, um, to be cool. You had to wear the certain brands. Yeah. So, yeah. And now, I mean, now the kids are kind of all over the place. I see a lot more, like, uh, I live in this neighborhood, but there's a lot of kids walking and they have to go out like one specific area to go to the the high school. And most of them are wearing non-branded stuff these days. It's I like, love that. like mm-hmm. black shirts and black hoodies and like, of course, gigantic jeans. Cause that's like the thing right now, but, <laughs> yeah, but well, it, it is, it is really strange to not see brands on things. I'm sure retailers and and companies hate that. Cause there's not as much brand loyalty as there used to be, but yep. I love it. It's like more creative. Um, and you see more of the inspiration behind people's look rather than just being a carbon copy. Of- yeah. And, and today, right, even right now on this, uh, we're opposite. I have this, the plain black shirt, but you have the fraud boxer shirt on. That's, a, that's a great shirt. Look at that. That is, I'm, I'm going to screenshot that and put it on this just so you know. <laughs> um, so let's, t- it, good, because I, I paid a fortune to have those made and they came out of my own pocket on that one. So uh, I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad that it's comfy. Um, my buddy, I had, a, I had a buddy that I used to know up in Sacramento he joined the military and now lives in Alabama and I threw the money his way because he's trying to start a screen printing business. So oh, cool. he did a really good job on them. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Good material. They're comfy. They wash easy. I'm, I'm selling the fraud boxer t-shirts for you over here. Excellent. 
<laughs> I appreciate that because I have about a hundred of them left that I need to actually sell, sell now to recoup some of my cost, you know? So everybody, <laughs> uh, I will be putting actual shirts up on the, uh, the website soon. So I'll be looking for that. I also have stickers now. Uh, I'll send you some of those too, though. But, awesome. um, so MRC, you you and I met in person at MRC. Um, our meetings were pretty brief because I think we were both super, super, super busy there. Uh, that's just kind of how it goes. But I wanted to specifically ask you, um, this was like a big, a big reason why I wanted to have you on, was as an MRC first timer, like you and I talked a lot about what to expect going into it. I put out two episodes about what to expect, got the hype up and everything. So talk to me about now that you were there as a first timer, what was it like? Give me the spill the beans on that. I was definitely intimidated going into it. Um, I'm still new to the industry. So going in and walking into a room in a space where you know the people that are attending, a lot of them have been doing this for 5, 10, 15, 20 years. And also being on the vendor side of things be a little bit, a little bit intimidating to walk into. So I was nervous. I was, I was nervous as to whether or not I would actually have good quality interactions if people that I had scheduled appointments with would actually show up for them. Um, and I didn't really know quite what to expect as far as the rest of the audience that I was going to be surrounded by for the, those couple of days. You know, my team, um, there's a lot of men on my team that I work with on the sales side of things. So I didn't know if I'd be in a sea of just a bunch of men, which I'm used to from construction, but I was hoping that there would be some female representation for me to get to know there. And I have to say all in all, I was very pleasantly surprised. I think the yeah. biggest thing for me was really the, the audience, the people that I did get to connect with that were there. And such an eclectic mix of people coming from all different walks of life and backgrounds. And that was probably the most exciting part about it. Yeah. That- I would, I will say like the, the, the woman thing is, is a, is a big focus that, that our industry has done over the last decade is trying to get more women into the payments and fraud space. And I think it's been very successful. I think had you come in like 2012, it would have been a lot more um, what you would expect for that time to be there. Um, and I would say that the the industry has spent so much to try and get more women into the, into the industry and it's working. And having special events for the women, like the women in payments, meetings, luncheons, um, regional meetings, things like that. So it's working. And, and I think it's, it's done a really good job, but also um, getting a more diverse audience as well has, has been pretty successful. Like you see a lot more people that that look like other people there, which is, is, is I would say it's been better th- than what I've seen at other conferences that I've done in the past. Um, so that's been really good. And I will say that the the age of the the attendee has started to skew a lot younger. It used to be I was like the youngest person there by like a lot. Um, now, granted, I have since got old and I'm no <laughs> longer young, but, uh, but there's a lot more people in their 20s there than there used to be, you know. Yeah, it really was an eclectic mix, I have to say. Um, so, you know, at one point I even walked into the women's bathroom and I was like, wait, all of these women are actually here for this conference? This is incredible. And we had a little bonding moment and it was so fun. Um, I had another woman come up to me and invite me to join the Women and Identity Networking Group, which I'm super excited to get involved in. Um And I did meet people from all over the country, people from very unique backgrounds, some who came from law enforcement or military backgrounds, which is pretty obvious to me how they could transition into fraud and and being in this space. And clearly there are people who want to protect. So that made sense. But then there was a lot of other people like me who kind of just happened to fall into the industry and have grown really passionate about it through their experience. So um, it was nice to have that mix of people. And, you know, being on the vendor side, I wasn't sure how people would receive me, if they would be comfortable talking to me and approaching me and sharing information with me and having that connection. And it was the other thing that I think I really noticed was that it was a pleasant surprise with how much people involved in the MRC really have a community. I've since attended other conferences um, representing us, and it's not, I didn't get the same level of camaraderie that I did at MRC. I think that, you know, we're in a very competitive industry. If you're, it doesn't matter if you're selling tickets or cars or, you know, makeup or whatever e-commerce company you're with, it is competitive. And so it's unique to be in a space where, those competitive companies are actually sharing some intellectual property and actually working together and seeing that how 
were willing to support one another one another through those challenges. I think I think that was really exciting for me, and that was a big standout from the whole the whole conference. Yeah, it's uh, we, they that is a, always a, a common thing. Is like people are surprised about the the community, and I will say like a lot of us OGs that have been in this thing for a long time, like we remember when it was a really small industry. Um, and so we all kind of just had to stick together because it was just a bunch of us dorks that had fallen into this industry in a room and like just crushing beers together and talking about fraud. And then as other people joined, we're like, well, you come over here to this group, you come in here, you come in here, you come in here. And then before you know it, it's 1600 people big and everybody's got the same thing. And I, I would say because I think nobody falls into the, like, or nobody seeks out this industry. They always fall into it. You have, you only get here if you care. And you only get to the conference if you care too, because if you were just doing it as like a job job, you're probably not going to be at the conference because people probably aren't going to invest in you to go to the conference, you know, and you have to really care to want to go to that conference to seek out that conference. Um, but the fact is, is like we all got to where we are because we were so into what we were doing. And that's why this conference is different is because we all really cared about this and liked this. And then we all got along. Some of us don't get along. There's a couple of people that I don't get along with, but you know, I just avoid them and then they go do their thing. I do my thing. But at the end of the day, my group that I have in this industry is like, is hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people big that I hang out with, that I've talked to. They come here. Like I was just uh, last Friday. Uh, I had one of the vendors that like we don't do business with, but I've, I've worked with this guy at multiple companies and he was in town. He's like, let's go get a couple of drinks. So we, had a lot of drinks you know but it was just a passing through thing you know it wasn't like it, it wasn't necessarily business you know i, I did put it all in this corporate card but it, <laughs> you know you know i will say that care piece was a big standout too i think that you have to like you said you have to care in this industry and you do grow passionate about it and if you don't feel that way you see a lot of really ugly dark sides of society and doing the jobs that we're all doing and it can get really daunting and depressing. And so if you're not really committed to being a part of that change and fighting against that and finding a better path forward for us all, you're not going to last. But the other you know, thing I want is if you're that passionate, it will potentially drive you to drink a little bit more too. It was very, very crowded over at the uh, yeah. area at the end of the day at MRC. <laughs> I know. And like, that's so I had, um, I had one of the big suites uh, for the, with the boardroom in it. So I had my own bar in my room and there was a couple of times where I'm like, it's quicker for me to go all the way to my room, fill up my glass with my Buffalo trace than it is to like <laughs> wait in this line at this crowded bar right now. But uh, I, I will say like, you know, that that's an interesting thing that as you were saying that I never really thought of about the, the dark, like we do see, like we see the worst of people and the people doing the worst of things. Like we just see crime, you know, like, like I'm sure people that like have to deal with like sex trafficking and looking at those sorts of things and probably have a little bit worse of a day. But at the end of the day, like we see people trying to just like take people's life savings from them every, every day. And I never thought about like how important it is until right now. I never thought about how important it is that we all come together and we do have a good time with crowd in the bar, getting those drinks, laughing, telling stories because it does kind of take that edge off and turn a negative lifestyle into a positive situation. Maybe that's why I like to go to conferences so much. Like I, I, I do love going to them. Now you on the sales side have a different view of going to conferences. Me, because I'm a merchant side, I get the wine and dine. So I love going to conferences. I get <laughs> as many as I possibly can, you know? Well, I'm the one usually doing the wining and dining, but I don't mind if the company puts the bill for me. So it's fine. We can enjoy the meal together. Right. <laughs> yeah. This is why next time, uh, next time dinner is going to be on you. So, uh, you, know, you just tell me where we're going. <laughs> it's it's always STK there. Always, always, always. <laughs> but um, so obviously, you know, we we talk about the good things that we do see in the MR, MRC's praises and, and they do put on a great event, but there are like some things, you know, as as from from you on the vendor side, uh, is there anything that, that could have been different? <laughs> Oh, tricky. Um, it's a tricky one to say, you know, yeah. yeah. You know, I, I think as a vendor at every single conference you want to attend, you always want more leads than what you got out of it. You want more quality conversations. You might even want to close a deal while you're there, which is probably not the most realistic, but you know, every, every company wants more and more and more from these, these conferences and to show that they're worth their while. I think for me, the biggest challenge at MRC this past year was having enough time to talk to all of the people that I did want to meet with. Um, what I noticed was there was just so many sessions, so much content, and some of it's really great content and it's really important. However, 
when you don't edit that down as much, you miss out on some of that critical networking time and people are just exhausted by the time that you do get to the end of the day. They don't have it in them to come and meet with vendors who might actually have a good solution for them or just to get to know somebody a little bit better to build a relationship. So, you know, I think everybody always wants more hours in the day, but I think if there was maybe just a little bit more time that was specifically structured for networking, specifically structured for going and walking the exhibit hall where you didn't have to make that choice between missing the good content or doing these things, I think that would have probably improved. But what they used to do at MRC was they would have like a raffle at the end. So you would get more entries into this raffle if you visited more booths. So like one time, one year they had like a passport thing and you had to get a stamp from every single vendor. Like they all had their own custom stamp. And you then you go and the, the raffle where it took place was in the back. And it was like this huge glass case. And they had, they probably had like a hundred different things. You know, they had, it didn't, it, not everybody was getting iPads and PS5s. Like it was like people, you get like poker chips for this, the, the casino, you know, you get like um some like a Casio watch. It was just like a bunch of things that it didn't cost a ton of money, but like people still like they participated, but it pulled them all to that back edge. So during the raffle time, everybody was in the back corner. So like they, it, it was where, where the raffle was taking place was strategic at that time. But, so they you know. did do it again. They did have like a, you had to collect wristbands this time. Yeah, I, I couldn't figure that out. Not going to lie. Like I was a little <laughs> confused about that. So I kind of abail- abailed and I, I've been given everybody uh, like like Romeo. Sorry, uh, everybody's so much shit about the PS fives and wanting one. But like I have one. So I didn't really need was, one. <laughs> that, that was the big draw was a PS five. I have to say on the last day during exhibit hall hours, there were lots of people who were just your swag shoppers coming through where they had no interest in actually talking to me, getting to know anything about Vera for my company. They just wanted the free swag. They wanted their wristband so that they could go up and, and do their little, uh, check out to potentially win a PS5. And there were definitely some fraud fighters committing some friendly fraud, trying to get multiple wristbands from visiting uh. I will say. Um, so I don't know how much those really help. I don't I don't know. I mean I used to be that guy that visited your booth and I would straight up say, I'm just here for the stamp. Sorry. Yeah. And I just move along. I gotta say, I can't blame people, but I do think it goes back to what's st- what we started talking about with this initial conversation. There's just that fear from merchants. You guys get hounded by salespeople every single day. So even showing just a a modicum of interest to somebody is like, oh, don't want to do that. Don't want to go there. Don't want them to. Yeah, because I'm going to get pounced on and I always do. Um, (laughs) So did you guys have swag there? We did, but we kept it to a minimal. So and our swag was actually pretty cool swag. Uh, So we gave away RFID protection for your wallet. So just like a little card you could slip in your wallet that will stop those RFID scanners from taking Those were a big hit, but surprisingly, and we just had this at the other conference we were at too, the biggest hit of our swag was actually um, these graphite pencils that our head of marketing found. So there are these pencils that you never have to sharpen. It's the strangest thing. Do they the ones that look like a pencil still, like kind of? Yeah. Yes. And it's like just a graphite tip on the end of it. So it looks like a pencil. It feels like a pencil holds like one, but you never have to sharpen it. And I'm not kidding you. People would come up to the booth and like their minds were blown. They were like, is this really going to work? Can I use it? And people are literally writing on paper. They would come back for two or three more for their families. Such a weird, quirky gift, but people really loved them. Wow. Uh, I'll have to see one of those next conference. Well, thank you for sharing uh, your feedback there. I, I think that that's super useful for me too, you know, just to, to know from a, a vendor perspective what worked and, and what didn't work, you know, not necessarily that it didn't work, just like what you would change. Um, so let's talk a little bit about your company and how you guys did there. What, what, what's, tell me all about you guys. Like, I, I think it's an interesting product. Sure. Uh, so Verif is in the identity verification space. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you listening to this have seen IDV providers that are out there. We're a little bit different than some of the legacy pri- providers you may have seen in the past. Um, what we focus on in the core of us is really document authentication combined with biometrics and doing a selfie match. Um, so our product was really born out of the idea of keeping friction to a minimum, but really confirming that somebody who you want to do business with in a digital setting is who they say they are. And if you're only doing document authentication, you're not really accomplishing that. And if you're only doing a selfie check, you're not accomplishing that. There's other tools out there that you can do something similar to try to detect that fraud, but there's nothing out there that's going to give you that kind of confidence that a person is who they say they are in comparison. 
So I've used I've used uh, similar products in the, in the past, long time ago in the past, you know, and I think it comes back to like that friction thing that we talked about earlier, which is like, what is the balance of, of the friction and, and when is, is something like necessary? Now, I will say that I have seen demo of your product and it is significantly smoother uh, than the last one and significantly more integrated. So so good job on that, guys. Um, yeah, but I've used them in the past. I, I think like, like a lot of us see them see encounter these types of tools signing up for banks crypto things you know like if we're trying to do that all online just a more more validation around that so um yeah yeah on the surface of things a lot of them look the same um but when you really when you well one when you have a trained eye of what to look for you do see differences between them and how they're functioning but really when you look at the results on the back end of things that's where we really really shine against the competition um and i would say I think some of that friction that we keep talking about and that keeps coming up, I'm having a lot of interesting conversations with clients who are seeing how putting IDV at the front of their process is actually removing friction later in the experience. Because from doing these steps, all of that data you get from that can really be populated elsewhere. Because we extract data from these documents that you can repurpose to do some of autofilling of your account. Oh, that's yeah. interesting. Yeah. So um, a lot of people are leveraging the data from IDV to remove friction for clients that are going through the process of actually trying to, let's say, set up a bank account or um, buy a car online, whatever it may be. All of that data you just collected can be used for more purposes than just verifying that somebody is who they say they are. I would really appreciate that because I'm so, it's like one of those things, like the old thing that's like, upload your resume here and then like you upload it. It's like, okay, now enter all of this information again. Like, <laughs> Sanity. So the other thing that I, that I think is becoming helping us to pick up traction here with the friction piece is when you think about being on your cell phone and actually creating an account on your cell phone and having to type in username and type in all this information, it's a heck of a lot easier to take a picture of your face, picture of your document than it is to type on your I, mobile. I'm all about that life. Yeah. So some friction's good friction, in my opinion. Yeah, and I think that like we, as we balance this this thing with this privacy and this this identity verification line of like where where is and what is what is necessary. I know obviously like if you're selling like a like a digital coupon, you know, or something like something super low value that isn't really attractive. You know, you don't need to have somebody take a photo of themselves. But if you're selling something more like a car or trying to get a mortgage or trying to open a bank account, you know, like those are things where there's there's a more of a need. So I think people really need to understand their, their need for how much uh, identity needs to be verified. But for the people that like definitely need a, another layer, I think services like you guys are, are super compelling and super interesting right now. I used to have like the old days, you know, it was, it seemed a little interesting, like an, an awkward back in like 2015 to do this. But now I think that the, the applications of it are a lot more necessary. So totally. yeah, I think you'd be surprised to see some of the spaces where it is getting implemented too. Um, you know, I wouldn't have expected to see that a Nordstrom or a Bloomingdale's or a Macy's might start adapting solutions like this, but in doing so, they're actually also starting to leverage biometric authentication in replacement of 2FA and MFA. That's a big thing that we do as well. So if you've, if you've done identity verification on your customers and they need to, to um, get access management for their account done, instead of having to do 2FA, which nobody really likes these days. It's kind I of hate it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I've ever met anybody that says, oh, I love 2FA. It's so fun to go through. But so when you think about it, if you've done IDV up front, if that allows you to get back into your account with just showing a selfie of your face for those high dollar transactions or strange behavior, you might've gotten locked out, that becomes a much more consumer friendly experience. So although we started in crypto, there's a lot more companies that are moving in this direction because of some of that functionality. And that's an excellent point. I think the self-service on like locking out accounts and everything like that is huge. I, I talked about it a little bit on my panel is like, try to find a way like on, on ATOs and stuff that you can like validate the person or like if they get locked out that you can revalidate them without having to have somebody do something to, to get them back into their account and get them on their way. Like a lot, like I, I have, I was just trying to actually at MGM uh, on the MGM app, I, okay. that horrific flow that they have, I was trying to get my, my, my points for my room and uh -oh. it, 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 they, their login account tries to make you force you into a sign up. So now I have two accounts and I was like, so I tried to do account recovery and it's like, you must call us. And I'm like, I ain't ever going to call you. Like, I'm never going to call. Like, have it, have it be a self-service thing. 
That happened to me with, I think it was American Airlines. I actually lost or couldn't put all of my uh, rewards points, my miles together because I had created two separate accounts by accident from an account takeover situation. I couldn't remember my password yeah. through all of this and then ended up just creating a brand new account because I was like, screw it. I don't want to deal with this. Mind you, I'm sitting there with like thousands and thousands of miles in the other account that are now separate and not being leveraged. So and the, okay, American Airlines too is the worst on their login because they make you put your your code, your password, and your last name on every single login. And it destroys like when I'm trying to like autofill and auto sign in, like when I'm like, trying to get quickly and the app signs you out like every five minutes too. Like bonkers on that app, like on that that login flow. Bonkers. Oh, Can I you call me <laughs> yeah i was like please american airlines call them and have and like i'm going to put all the contact information and i'm going to tag you american airlines in the description of this to please make this thing better <sighs> well thank you very much for coming on the podcast today and sharing the feedback about the mrc and talking to me about what you guys are doing and sharing your life um i don't think we touched on the fact that you're a really big fish fan so i know there's a lot of fish fans in this fraud space so uh next conference everybody grab erica and you guys could just like fish out all day long uh yeah instead you know. of going to conferences we could just meet on summer tour we'll do a little networking there plenty of time to do that right and then you guys you know what you could do then you could uh you could expense all these fish tours you know a aim and his wheels are turning in his head right now <laughs> you know those fish tours can uh, take quite a bit of my paycheck so amen definitely give me a call we can we can work something out <laughs> you guys are going to become best friends i know i know he's going to dicks too because he was posting on facebook all about it and i was making a joke about it being his second home i don't think he quite understood understood my joke but you know it's okay <laughs> I, i'm sad that i missed him i was told to go find him at the conference i was told to go look for i believe he has a long beard from what he I does he does it's not as long as it used to be but it's still pretty it's still it's still down there yeah he's a funny man he was my roommate in uh san jose when i lived up there <laughs> oh very nice well i didn't get a chance to meet amen at mrc because i was just so busy so he's on my list of people that i do need to connect with still and maybe it'll be at a fish show maybe it'll be at a conference where we're fighting fraud together who the heck knows i'm gonna send you guys a damn email so you guys can connect and then you 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 guys you couples can get together at, at dicks <laughs> and go hang out I will be there. It'll be a fun time. Jordan, you should come along. Uh, he's trying to get me to go to the Hollywood Bowl one. And I just keep saying, I'll think about it. I'll think about it. But, you know, I, I'm gonna, I've never been. I don't even know if I even have heard them. You don't have to. That's the best part. Like, you don't have to know their music. You don't have to know a thing about them. You will go and you will instantly feel welcomed by the rest of the community that's there. And I, in my opinion, their music transcends pretty much every genre. So if you just enjoy music and musicians and live entertainment, it's a fun experience to at least check out. So I just picture it being a bunch of just dudes with glasses, gray hair and mustaches <laughs> wearing <laughs> flip flops. Like, I know I don't I don't picture them looking like you. That's why I was a little surprised by that. Like all shapes and sizes. <sighs> Well, thank you again for coming on the podcast. I really appreciate your time. I'm going to put all the links up to you um, and to your company. And it's just been, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for, for doing this. I know you were a little nervous about this one. So um, you did an excellent job. So thanks again for being on here. Thank you so much, Jordan. It was great to be here. And thanks for having me. Anytime. Thank you for listening to today's episode. I really hope you enjoyed the content. Don't forget to visit my friends at Spec, who just happen to be this quarter's sponsors. Their patented Trust Cloud platform can help you orchestrate the future of your fraud and payments journey for a quick and easy no code implementation. It's really quite impressive. See it for yourself at www.specprotected.com today and ask for a demo on your very own site. Thanks again for listening.